joining us now on the show is going to be David Flat. He's the executive director for the Ford Piquette Avenue plant. We are going to bring him in on the phone line. Thank you for being with us today. It's great having you. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad to be here. So is the plant actually open to visitors right now? Yes, we are open right now, although we had to reduce our day somewhat. Um, so right now, we would be open on Thursday uh, to Sunday, and we have guided tours at noon and 2. We're open from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. So that is a little bit different than we were open before, um, because previously we were open on a Wednesday, but until things settle down more, um, we'll keep Wednesday closed. And we did have another tour at uh, 10 a.m., so we've had to reduce the number of tours. Uh, it's kind of difficult for the tour guides to give three tours in a row, and they have to wear a mask, of course. And then um, we do do social distancing, so we've reduced the size of what the tours would normally be. Um, yeah, and then we just try to keep everybody spaced uh, throughout it. But, but we are open. Um, we are definitely reduced in what the amount of traffic we're seeing, so... You know, we're only getting more or less 20% or so of what our normal attendance would be. Because uh, over the past couple of years, our attendance had grown considerably. And with that, so obviously it's the birthplace of the Model T. If I've it never is. been there before, what am I going to see and what am I going to experience? Yeah, so the Ford Kid Avenue plant it is the birthplace of the Model T. So it was actually the second factory, well, it was the first factory that was owned and purpose-built by the Ford Motor Company. Now, they had previously owned... I mean, rented a um, smaller garage on Mac Avenue, but they were only there temporarily. Um, that's when they were building the original Model A. But it was so successful, then that's when Ford decided to go ahead and build the Piquet Avenue plant. And they built what they, we would call the letter cars, which ultimately ended up with the Model T. Um, so the letter cars would include the Model A, the Model B, the Model C, the F, the N, the R, the S and the T, and there's also a K in there as well. So we have the only complete collection of those early Ford letter cars that you will see on display at one time anywhere in the world. And our Model B, it's an extremely rare car. There's only six or seven of them in, in the world, and it is actually serial number one for that car. So that is kind of like the main uh, thing to see when you come there. But we also have Henry Ford's office is also located on the second floor. And then on the uh, third floor of the building, we do have a Milwaukee Junction car collection. So those were actually other cars that were built in, um, it would be the kind of north end area of Detroit. So that would include uh, cars such as Cadillac, uh, the Brush, Regal, uh, Flanders, Hubmobile. And then after Ford, um, Studebaker was actually located at the Cat Avenue plant. And then we also have a variety of other um, Model T conversions, Model T Speedster race cars. And then the most important room in the building really is the secret experimental room in the back of the third floor. And that's the area where the Model T was invented. So there's a lot to see there. We usually have anywhere between 62 to 63 cars. Um, some of them are the same, but then some of them will change. And we've also added several new exhibits over the past few years as well. Well, we are the Motor City and the history of the car started right here in Detroit, in the greater Detroit area. But as far as, you know, you go to the plant in the museum there, and it's about cars, but how did this industry shape the Motor City and to the community in which we are today? Well, yeah, I mean, it was very important. And, and that's one of the things, too, is that when Ford later uh, left the cat then that's when they went to highland park because the first twelve thousand model t's were uh, built at the cat and then ultimately they built over 15 million and a lot of those were built at the highland park just up woodward from the cat and that's where the assembly line started so in the factory at the cat they were all done by station assembly um, and you had a lot of different ethnic groups that came to work at the factory there and they would all work as uh, crews, each one of them building a car. And one of the unique things about Ket as well is that it was the first factory to produce um, over 100 cars in a day. And that was very significant. That was really when the industry started to boom. That had been in uh, 1906. 
and that was actually the Model N. It wasn't even the, the Model T, which a lot of people wouldn't know that that was the number one selling car uh, for that year. But it's really what allowed um, for the progression for the Model T to really be produced in such great numbers that it that it was. And then when they moved to Highland Park and they started to mass produce the Model T, then that's when Ford was eventually able to put into his five dollar day. Um, and that's what really brought people from around the world who wanted to come get a job with Ford because everybody wanted to have a chance to have a, a better life. And so that really set up the uh, industry. And then there's also the fact that a lot of people who worked with Ford, um, such as Flanders and Hupp, and they went on to make their own car companies as well. And eventually Flanders became EMM and, and bought up by Studebaker as well. So there's a close connection between a lot of the different car companies that you'll see, even with Henry Ford's um, second company, because he actually had two failed attempts at companies before Ford Motor Company. I had the Detroit Automobile Company and had the uh, Henry Ford Company. And with the Henry Ford Company, he had started to develop the car, and but he got kind of too focused on racing, and so they kind of got tired of waiting for the car to be produced and um, they brought in Henry Leland, and then that car actually eventually becomes the Cadillac. So that's a very interesting connection that you have between all those different car companies from early on. David Flatt with us. He's the executive director of the Ford Paquette, plant, uh, Paquette Avenue plant, joining us today on the Oakland County Megacast. And David, earlier you mentioned that the museum is open with limited hours and, and some capacity limits. As the pandemic has progressed, especially early on, and, and right now as we're heading into, as we, we have been heading into a surge of cases in Michigan and throughout the country, are there any virtual programs that are being provided, educational programs, or, or beyond that, that are being provided to the community or to people that are generally visiting the museum we, at this time? Yes, we do have actually a 3D uh, tour that's available. If you go to the home page of our website and you just scroll down a little bit onto the page, you will see this um, 3D tour, which is really neat because it'll take you on an interactive journey of the uh, museum itself. So you will be able to see those cars that are on display there now and see some of our new exhibits as well. And it's a very good educational tool. I've had um, teachers even from far away as Maryland contact me about wanting to use this in their classroom. So I think it's very helpful to see this 3D tour. It was made by a Matterport and a BTS. And so it was a very good system. So for anybody who maybe doesn't have the chance to come see the museum right now, and I know a lot of people aren't able to travel. It's still a way for them to experience the museum and then hopefully it'd spark interest to when things get better, they'd be able to come into it. And, and that's one of the things with the pandemic too. We were affected like a lot of the museums here where we had to shut down for a certain um, amount of time. Um, and we've had to enforce that everybody wears masks when they come in. And most public is very understanding of, of that. that that's going to be required when you come into the building. So it's everybody's just trying to trying to live with it for now. Um, and the staff's making through it. Our docents are have been really good about it. I've kind of broke up now the days on, on when they come in and such, so we have a different docent for every day, which is actually also a good thing because when you come to the museum, you hear a different story from every one of them. So it's worth visiting not just once, but multiple times. And David, yes. with that, so many organizations and museums have had to change and pivot uh, during this crisis and the pandemic. What do you think is going to be a long-term benefit for you and your organization coming out of this? Well, I think part of it is what we were just talking about, too, with the online presence. I think that um, being able to reach people online, because what we saw is when we did go where we had to shut down for a little while is that we got a huge uptick in our um, 3D tour, which luckily we had completed early in the year uh, prior to the shutdown. So it was before the pandemic even started. It was interesting because Jane, so the last two years were both record years for us. So we had over 31,000 people tour the museum for each one of those years. And then our January and February were the best January and February we ever had. So when the shutdown came in March, we were really 
booming up until that point, and then it all went to nothing. So we definitely had to refocus, and we worked on promoting our 3D tour, and we saw a huge uptick in the number of people that were coming to view that. So we knew there was still a lot of interest in the museum. And another thing that was difficult is because Piquet is the TLC um, actually counted us as the number one uh, destination wedding venue in the state of Michigan. So normally every Saturday we have a wedding at Piquet. But because of the pandemic, that greatly um, altered things because we weren't able to have weddings for a long time. And then we even had to transition to where we were doing smaller, what we'd call pop-up weddings, where you have, say, 10 people that will be at a wedding. And we started doing more photo shoots and um, engagement photo shoots and things like that where people would maybe go get married at the courthouse, but then they would come there to do their photos. So we really had to transition um, until we can get back to a point where next year where we can start to do those um, weddings again, hopefully. And you are a nonprofit, so how is this yeah. impacting your bottom line right now? Well, we've done the best that we can, um, and the reason for that is because we do have a great membership, and we have a lot of them that have been very generous and to help fund us um, through this event. I mean, it's the pandemic. I mean, it's been hard. I know it's been hard for museums throughout the country, and especially here in Detroit, there's been a lot of difficulty. But because of the generosity of a lot of our donors, it's helped make us through. And then when we were able to start having, opening up or letting some tours come in, um, a lot of people have started to flow back through. And like I said, it's not as numbers we reached before um, but it's enough that we were able to keep the doors open and that's the main thing for right now is that we just are staying open and then we try to make it through this and get to better times hopefully and then we'll get back to those numbers like we were before because like I said before the pandemic we were doing fantastic well, and we are starting to see a surge and uptick in the number of COVID cases. Correct. What will happen to your organization if the state does go into another shutdown? How long do you think uh, you could survive another shutdown? Oh, we're, we're prepared to survive another shutdown. But the question would be if that does happen on how, how long would it last? And then when it hopefully at that point when it opens back up on how quickly can we gear up and be ready to go again? And that's what we we just have to keep focused and um, keep on doing online what we can. That's like with our social media presence in the last couple of years, it's actually went from, we had 3,000 likes a couple of years ago and now we're over 23 and a half thousand. So we've seen a dramatic increase in that in that people have a lot of interest in the museum and the history here because Paquette is really a center of innovation in the automobile industry. That's where Henry Ford really got his, his start. Um, Edsel Ford was there as well as a child, so there's a lot of rich history there. Um, and we have a lot of support from car clubs as well. So groups such as the Piquet Tees, um, Detroit Tees, International uh, T Organization, and then also the Model A clubs and among many other car clubs have been very generous in supporting us. Henry Ford Heritage Association has also worked very closely with us, as well as Motor Cities uh, Heritage Area. So these are all important organizations that have helped keep us going through these very uh, difficult times and, and continue to do so. And I, I would see even if there is another shutdown, these groups will continue to help support us and make sure that we do make it through because it is such a historical gem and it's important that it does stay open. Um, and the thing is, our last year, our educational programming had really started to develop very well. We were having lots of schools come in, doing some uh, STEM-related activity days and such. And I can see when we can get back to that point again, then we will really be uh, thriving. And, and we have a lot of big plans um, for the next few years. Unfortunately, some of them have been delayed because of the pandemic. But right now, the museum is on the second and third floor. We have tenants that are occupy the first floor that rent from us. So our plans are in the next few years is that we're going to restore the first floor, at least a section of it, to the way that it would have been, which would actually include the office of James Cousin, who ran the business part 
of the business for Ford, which was an integral part of them of the success of the early Ford Motor Company. Um, and then once that happens, I, you're going to see a, even a lot better museum that we're able to offer because we'll be able to increase our educational programming and um, bring in even additional vehicles into the building. Because right now we really have, we're to our limit basically on vehicles, so there's a lot of people would like to get other vehicles in there, so we have to be very selective about what we bring in the, to the collection. Because the collection is a mixture of vehicles from our own vehicles, private collectors, and then from club members as well. And David, just about another minute with you, and quickly, if um, you are still offering tours right now at this time, how can people sign up if they are interested in trying to get in on a tour and do the tickets sell out? Yeah, so we we do. We If you are wanting to get on a tour, it is, I mean, you can walk in and see, but it's also good to do ahead of time. But one of the things I did was to make tickets available for sale online. So if you go through our website, that's Ford Piquette, P-I-Q-U-E-T-T-E, plant.org, you can actually buy tickets through us online you can also buy them through eventbrite and register a spot for that tour which will guarantee you a spot um our adult tickets are 15 seniors 10 and uh, students are 10 dollars and youth are five dollars and children four and under are free to visit and we are a blue star museum as well so well uh, Dave, if you're active, active duty military you get in for free oh that's great and you know we do have uh, veterans day coming up this week so yes i'm sure and we i have will some be people. offering um free admission for veterans on Thursday as well. So any of you would like to come in, you're more than welcome. We do get a lot of veterans and active duty military, and I thank them for their service. Well, thank you for your service as well, and to you and all the members of your staff over there. Uh, as you said, it's a center for innovation, the birthplace of the Model T, and such a great reminder right now um, about where we started and where we are now, the Motor City is rich in history for the automotive industry we put america on wheels here in right here in the state of michigan right here in our own backyard so thank you again for everything that you do if anyone out there wants to go and take a tour try to get a ticket online it's an important place to see it's just amazing the history but what i love to see is when he said it's a center for innovation so we have this younger generation and them using it as an educational tool for the young kids and so many people in the STEM um, group and industries so that they can also experience the Motor City and not just today's technology.